Thank you, Lord, for your name, God. Lord, for every knee will bow and every tongue will confess at your name, God. Sickness has to leave at your name. Disease has to leave at your name, God. Lord, everything is subject to your name, Lord. And we thank you for the power that lies in your name, Jesus. We love you and we honor you, Master. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good Lord, hand clap of praise. Amen. God is good. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open with me this morning to the book of Malachi. If you don't know where Malachi is, once you get to Matthew, take a hard left and you'll end up in the book of Malachi. It's the last book in the, in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1. Thank you for those of you who are joining in live with us online. Uh, we appreciate you. <clears throat> we love you. And uh, we pray that this message ministers to you. Um, and I pray it ministers to all of you just as well as it ministered to me um, in putting it together. Um, Malachi chapter 1. <clears throat> We just came out of Thanksgiving, um, and, you know, hopefully you guys all had a fantastic Thanksgiving. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was able to break my mom out <laughs> and get her out of the, uh, the rehab center and get her uh, here and have uh, Thanksgiving with the family, and so that was, that was fantastic. We had a good time. Um, so I pray that your Thanksgiving was great as well. We all ate probably more than we ought to, uh, more pies, more turkey, uh, stuffing, mashed potatoes, gravy, all that stuff that goes with it. Um, we probably ate more than we ought to, more than we should have. Um, but nonetheless, it always seems inevitable, unless you go out to eat, uh, well, no, it can happen when you go out to eat as well, but it always seems inevitable that we end up cooking too much food for Thanksgiving, and we always have leftovers. Amen? Uh, it's just, it just seems like we always have leftovers left after Thanksgiving. Uh, Pastor Janet and Christy was cooking um, Thursday, and oh, they started Wednesday night, <clears throat> and went on into uh, continued Thursday morning. And I said, you know, we don't, we're not going to have that many people here. We're going to have a ton of leftovers left, right? And uh, Pastor Janice like, well, I'd rather have more than enough than not enough. You know, and so um, <clears throat> this morning, the title of my message is Leftovers. We're speaking on the subject of leftovers. Um, and so in Malachi chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 6. Um, Leftovers can be good, but leftovers can also be bad. There's some leftovers, me and Christy was talking about this, that are actually better than when it's fresh, right? There are some things that just, it just hits different when it's leftover than when it's fresh. I don't know if it's because everything, all the juices soak in or what, what the deal is, but it's just better. But after a while, leftovers gets old. Amen. Leftovers isn't any good anymore. They tend to spoil. They tend to go bad. Um, there are certain things that, that I don't mind eating as leftovers. And there are certain things that are, when we have leftovers, I don't eat them. Because I don't like those as leftovers. Um, and so, you know, leftovers can be good and it can be bad. We're going to be looking at it from... Uh, the, not the good aspect of it this morning, but the bad aspect of it. And so in Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 14, it says uh, this. <clears throat> a son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my uh, revengeance? says the Lord of hosts. 
To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? Verse 7. You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? But saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor, who, who he, uh, or would he be pleased with you? Would he accept your, your favorability, your, your favorably? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 9. But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? <clears throat> Who is there even among you? who should shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For, for from the raising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it, in that you say, the table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruits, its food is contemptible. Verse 13. You also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus, you bring an offering. Should I accept this offering from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who in his flock, who, who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. And so <clears throat> here we see, the prophet Malachi is coming against what they're doing in that time and in that in that uh, in in that era. The 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 uh, the people of the Lord are are giving offerings to the Lord that aren't acceptable to them. They're basically leftovers, and I mean, we could. I want to speak from the from the subject heading of leftovers this morning, but we could also include in this message. We could include bickering. They were bickering with God, talking back to God, saying, well, in what way were we dishonoring you? In what way? You know, they're talking back to him, you know, and, and bickering with the Lord. You know, when, when our kids do that, we don't like that, right? <laughs> you know, when you tell your kids something and they, and they smart off back to you, ooh, boy. <laughs> in today's society, kids get away with that. But you go, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years back, and that was not acceptable. If you smarted off to your parents back then, ooh, you better pray you don't have a willow tree outside your house. Amen? You better pray you don't have one outside your house because you know what's going to happen. You're going to get sent outside to get a switch so that you can be spanking by it. Amen? In, in today's society, they're, you know, parents just bicker back and forth with their kids, you know. And, and so we could add bickering in there this morning. We could, we could add, you know, burdensome. You know, their offerings were burdensome. It says um, in, um, in verse 10, it says, you also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it. Like, this is, I can't give you the best, God. You know, I can't give you my very best. And so, you know, you, we, could, we could include burdensome into this. But this morning I want to speak from the heading of leftovers. And so they offered, uh, they offered their crumbs is basically what they were offering to God. They were offering their leftovers, their hand-me-downs, and they expected God to bless it is what they were doing. 
They were, they were taking their second best and giving it to God and expecting God to bless it. How many times do we take our second best and we expect God to bless it? The priests uh, were offering blemish sacrifices that were offensive to God. Absolutely offensive to God. In verse 8, you can look and it says, And now when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Not only were those blemish sacrifice, uh, sacrifices offensive to God, but he called them absolutely evil. He's like, I, I can't accept this offering because it's second rate. It's second hand. It's your leftovers is what you're giving me. You know, we, uh, when you, if, if you had Thanksgiving dinner and you got a bunch of leftovers in your house, and you had the president of the United States coming over. Would you be like, sir, wait a minute. <laughs> Let me go in the fridge. I think I got some leftover mashed potatoes and gravy. Some stuffing. Let me, I, got some, I got some turkey leftover. Let me throw it together real quick. And I'll give you some. Le no. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't give them your second rate meal. But you would make a fresh meal. A fresh offering. And you would bless them with it. Amen. And so we, you know, are we giving our second best? Are we giving leftovers to God is what I'm talking about this morning. And so uh, look at, look at the, the last half of verse 13 and then the first half of verse 14. It says, and you bring the stolen, the lame and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand? Says the Lord. But... Cursed is the deceiver who has in his hand or in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. And so here the word uh, deceiver, if you look it up in the, the Hebrew, uh, it's the word nakal is, is that word for deceiver, which also translates as deceiver, swindler, or a cheat is what that word also Means If you look this scripture up in the NLT, I actually think it says the word cheat in that version of the Bible. And so here God calls a person a cheat who can give God or who can give better sacrifices but chooses not to. God calls you a cheat. If you say, well, you know what, God, I'm just going to give you second best. You know, I mean, I, after all, God, I'm tired this morning. I stayed up late last night. I mean, I'm just... I'm dragging this morning. So God, I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm here to fulfill my obligatory duty of coming to church. And so that's why I'm here. That you might as well have not even came. Amen. You know what, when we, when, you, when we have kids and they're getting ready, they're getting ready to go to school. What do we make them to, what do we make them do the night before? We make them go to bed early. Why? So that they're well rested and have good, good cognitive skills and, and learning ability when they're at school the next day and they're not sluggish and run down. So we make them go to bed early. But yet we on a Saturday night want to stay up way late and then we come into church the next morning and we're giving God our second best. Amen. This, this message hit me first. I just want you to know. <laughs> Not only did I have to hear it, but I had to write it. I had to put it down. I, so I went through this a couple times. So I've done been repenting over and over saying, God, forgive me for giving you my second best. Forgive me, God, for giving you leftovers when you deserve far better than those leftovers. Instead of honoring God with their best, they kept the best for themselves and gave God the second best or better known as what we're talking about this morning, their leftovers of what they have. They gave, it, they, they gave their second best to God. You know, they, they, they didn't take their, their very best. They're like, well, you know, it's, it's an animal sacrifice nonetheless. Even though it might have a, a broken leg or, or, you know, it might be blemished in whatever way or the other, it's still an animal sacrifice, so it should do. No. God says here, actually, that he calls it evil. Is what he does, is what he calls it. What a slap in the face. God's love for us is so extravagant 
that he chooses to sacrifice the most precious thing that he had for you and us, for you and I, in order to redeem us, and that was his son, Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, the love that some people show in return for his grace and his mercy amounts to literally just piddly old crumbs sprinkled upon the altar of worship and sacrificed to Almighty God. And then we say, look, God, here's my crumbs. Aren't you proud of me? Look, God, here's my second best. I, I still made a, 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 a sacrifice to you. I still made an offering to you, God. Here's my second best. And God says, I don't even want it. I don't even want it. It's, it, it's better for you not to sacrifice and, and, give, and, and give something to the Lord than to give him your second best. God doesn't deserve second best. God gave you his very best. Does that mean that, that if, if you come in in the morning and, and you're like, because a lot of people are like, well, well Rico, what about when, when we, you know, the whole saying, fake it till you make it. I agree. I 100% agree. I'm talking this morning when we continually cycle, we just cycle that rhythm of continually giving God our second best. Every single one of us is going to have a bad day. Every one of us is going to have a bad day. And those are the days in which fake it till you make it comes into play. That's when that comes into play. But it's those people, and I know it's none of us in here. Definitely nobody watching by stream. But it's nobody that we know that continually gives God their second best. That's what I'm talking about this morning. It's continually giving God. They, 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 would, they, they would get their, their, their flock and they would get it together and they'd just continually be given to God their second best, second rate to God. These ritualistic uh, blemish sacrifices are absolutely offensive to God and he prefers no sacrifice at all, which is what I was talking about just a minute ago. In verse 10, it says, Who is there even among you who should shut the door so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. It's better to not give a sacrifice than to give an empty ritual and an offering that, that would fall short of our very best. It's better to not even do it. God requires our pure, unblemished sacrifice to please him. And so don't confuse this with any form of works, work-based uh, salvation, though. Don't confuse this with, with, you know, we can earn our salvation. You can't earn your salvation. It doesn't matter if you give the best of the best of the best sacrifices. You cannot earn your salvation. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. The only pure and unblemished sacrifice that can atone for our sins and reconcile us to God is Jesus Christ. And we all know that. Jesus is the spotless lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Turn with me to Romans 12. Romans 12. Our sacrifices no longer needed. Our sacrifices no longer needed. Do we still need to make sacrifices? Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> it says this in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, basically I'm pleading with you. I'm begging you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So the answer is yes, God continues to expect sacrifices from his people. He won't expect or he won't accept just any sacrifice. It must be the very best that we have. So yes, we still need to make a sacrifice to God. Second Samuel, King David knew about this. Let me read this to you in Second Samuel. 2 Samuel 24, 24 through 25. This is what, second, this is what this is, uh, King David, he knew a little bit about sacrificing. <clears throat> it says this. Then the king said to Aruna, No, 
but I will surely buy it from you for a price, nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor from the oxen for uh, and the oxen for forty shekels of silver. Verse twenty-five. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. Let me kind of give you a little bit of a backstory of what's going on here. So King David is going along and, and he takes a census of the land. He takes a census of the land and the Lord is absolutely irate with King David. He gets upset with King David um, and because I kind of think it was, it was a little bit out of King David's pride that he took all this, the census. And um, I mean, there's all kinds of commentary on this passage here. But um, so King David took a, a, a census. Nonetheless, the Lord was angry with him. So the Lord gave him three choices that he could choose from for his, for his punishment for taking the census. He could choose from three different choices. You can read about that on your own time in, 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 uh, in chapter 24 of, of 2 Samuel. But God gave him three different choices. The choice that David chose was a plague to sweep across the land for three days is what he chose. And so in this time, 70,000 people had died because of King David's sin can you imagine if you sinned and you caused 70,000 people to die I would feel absolutely horrible if that happened that would that would be horrid and we could we could go along the line I mean this could preach along the lines of well we're doing it because we're not witnessing I mean we could preach along that line but I'm not talking about that this morning <laughs> But 70,000 people had experienced death because of King David's arrogance and his pride. And so he goes to this, this person here in, 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 uh, in 2 Samuel 24, and he's like, hey, I need to build an altar for the Lord. I need to sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, I, want, I, can I, have, I, need to, I need to purchase your threshing floor. I need to purchase your oxen. And, and this person's like, no, King David, you don't even have to buy. It's yours. You just take it and you can have it. But King David says, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm not going to offer something to God that doesn't cost me something. And so he wasn't willing to just get it for free and to make an offering to the Lord because that's second rate. That's not first class offering. It cost David something dear. He paid for this offering so that way he could, he could atone for what the mistake that he made and sacrifice to the Lord. And then the Lord lifted the plague off the land and they were done. And so, you know, King David knew a little bit about making a sacrifice. You say, well, that's, that's in the Old Testament. You're right, that is. Let's go to the New Testament. Mark chapter 14. Mark, chapter 14, we're going to read verses 3 through 9. We're talking about making a sacrifice, making an offering, a sacrifice offering to the Lord. Mark 14, 3 through nine, and this is New Testament. This is Jesus already hung on the cross, right? <laughs> Jesus already hung on the cross. He was the greatest sacrifice ever. But yet, we're going to see in passage here people still making a sacrifice to the Lord. Mark chapter fourteen, verses three through nine. It says, "And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper." As he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil, uh, of oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there was some 
who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil absolutely wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish. And whenever you wish, you may do good. Uh, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever this gospel, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. So we see this woman who poured this costly perfume, this costly fragrant oil on the head of Jesus to, to express her love and her devotion and her worship to her master. <clears throat> this stuff <clears throat> could have been sold for a lot of money. It could have been sold for, I don't even know how, I mean, a lot of money and given away to the poor. And, and they're mocking her, but... <clears throat> She wanted to give her very best. That was the best she had to offer. You know, so when we make a sacrifice, we're, we, your tithes and your offerings, that's a sacrifice. Your time and your talents, that's a sacrifice. Your, <clears throat> your wisdom, that's a sacrifice. That's, when you present that stuff to the Lord and you give it to God, you're making a sacrifice is what you're doing. I'm not talking this morning about we got to make a sacrifice so go get your cat, Spotty, and put him on the altar <laughs> and slay your cat. I'm not talking about that. So don't go get Spotty because Spotty didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> it wasn't Spotty's fault. It's our fault. We need to do the sacrifice. Amen. <clears throat> so I'm not talking about we still need to make an animal sacrifice. But we all, there's different sacrifices that we make. Let, you say, well, that's just one example. Well, okay, let me give you another example. Turn with me to Luke. Are we all right this morning? <clears throat> Luke 21. Luke 21. We're going to read um, <clears throat> 1 through 4. Luke 21, 1 through 4. It says, and he took up, or sorry, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites, <clears throat> putting in a very small amount. So he said, truly I say to you, that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. <clears throat> but she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. She gave her very best. It wasn't much <clears throat> compared to everybody else. But what you have to offer, nobody else can offer that. Each and every one of us has something to offer to the Lord. Some may say, well, you know, <clears throat> what I have to offer to the Lord just seems minuscule compared to what that person has to offer to the Lord. I mean, they, they're rolling in, in, in beamers or you living in nice houses or got all this stuff. I, my, my offering is, is just minuscule in comparison to theirs. Yeah, but it's not about the size of the offering as much as it is the heart behind the offering. <clears throat> that's where the, see these people in Malachi their heart wasn't there they, they had lost their heart of worship towards the Lord and they decided you know what just, just an animal go, just go pick a, a stinking animal I don't care what you just go pick one and bring it here so we can do the stupid sacrifice that's what it, what it amounted to them as 
They got it. They, they, it just didn't have meaning to them anymore. Well, I'm just going to go to church just because I don't want to get a call from Pastor Janet to ask him, oh, where were you at? We missed you. I don't want to have to deal with that, so I'm just going to go to church. Well, that's, that's a second-rate sacrifice. Amen. You shouldn't be coming to church because of anybody else, but you should be coming to church because of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Let me give you one more. Luke 7. Take a left a few streets. Luke chapter 7. Verses 36 through 48. I'm going to read it out of the NLT version. I like how it states it in here. Luke 7, 36 through 48. <clears throat> One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to come to his home for a meal. So Jesus accepted the invitation and sat down to eat. A certain immoral woman heard uh, he was there and brought a beautiful jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisees, who was the host, saw what was happening and who the woman was, he said to himself, this proves that Jesus is no prophet. If God had really sent him, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus spoke up and answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. All right, teacher, Simon replied, go ahead. Then Jesus told him this, this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, <clears throat> I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss of greeting, but she kissed my feet again and again from the time I first came in. You, neg you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they, they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. So we see here this lady, <clears throat> her love compelled her to offer up a pure sacrifice that was pleasing to God. She didn't hold anything back. She even was willing to sacrifice her dignity and her pride because Simon knew all about her. Simon knew that she was a sinner. Simon knew that she, you know, who is she that she's in the presence of, of, of Jesus, the Messiah? You know, so he began to cast judgment. He began to cast, you know, uh, judgment towards her saying she shouldn't even be here. You know, so when, when you know, she, she was like, you know what? I don't care what they think about me. I'm going to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. When is the last time we, we stopped caring about what people think about us? You know, the older we get, the less we care about what people think about us. I've come, I'm starting to find that out. I'm starting to find that out. The older I get, I'm like, I don't care. Let them think what they want to think. I mean, I remember being in, in high school and I cared what everybody thought about me. I cared about what everybody was thinking and what everybody thought. You know, now I'm just like, I, they can think what they want to think. You know, they can say what they want to say. 
You know, people can try and talk to me till they're blue in the face and tell me that Jesus isn't real. But I have, have experienced him in ways that no one could even explain or, or come up with an explanation of. It was just a God thing. So you can't tell me that God doesn't exist. I don't care what you think. You can't tell me that God doesn't exist. I know he does. You know, so the older we get, the less we care about it, what people think. But, but a lot of times there's still that pride that, that is inside of us. And we're like, well, I don't want to get up and, and go to the altar because what, is, what if someone thinks something this or that or whatever? You know, she's like, I don't care. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wash my feet or his feet with my tears I'm going to anoint his feet with expensive perfume. I'm going to give him, give a sacrifice that costs me a lot. It costs her pride. It costs her her dignity as well as finances. I mean, she could have made money off of that perfume. And so uh, this woman wept and on as well as kissed the feet of Jesus in a room full of people who knew her. And were already judgmental towards her. And she set her pride aside, laid broken at Jesus' feet, not caring who was there to witness it, not caring what anybody else said, but she was going to do her very best and give a very best offering to the Lord. So let me close with this. Like I said earlier, there's so many lessons that we can, we can get from this Malachi chapter 1 among you know, uh, talking about um, attitudes of bickering back and forth with the Lord. They were bickering back and forth with him. We can have, um, you know, burdens. We can say, well, just giving, sacrificing to the Lord is, is, is burdensome. It's weary, wearisome. Um, you know, and so our hearts aren't right in the right place at the right time. So it just, you know, it's hard to sacrifice to God. Um, you know, but... Most of all, what I want to get across this morning is don't give God your leftovers. Don't give God your second best. No matter what we do or sacrifice, it will never be acceptable to God without love. Love is where it has to come from. You have to sacrifice. God doesn't care how big the sacrifice is. You say, well, you know, I don't have a lot of money to give. That's fine. You know, it's not the amount. It's the heart that you give with. I don't have a lot of talent to give. That's fine. It's not, it's not the amount of talent. It's the heart that you give it with. Amen? We all have a talent in one way or another. We all are talented in various ways. You say, well, you don't understand. I, I trip over my own feet. There's no way I'm talented. We're all talented in a different way. You know, so you, you, you give what you have. God has created you the way you are for a purpose. If God wanted you to be somebody else and to, and to give somebody else a sacrifice, then he would have made you that person. Amen. Amen. So don't look at other people's sacrifice and say, well, my sacrifice isn't, isn't as good as theirs. No, your sacrifice is the best you have. And, and it's, it's pleasing to God when you give your first and your very best. You give your first to God. Whatever it is, your first to God. This morning... Um, I just, just using this as an example, not to pat on the back, but Christy had started doing some work for her brother, answering some phones, and she got her first paycheck the other day uh, for doing it, and that's what was in the offering this morning, first fruits. She gave her the whole the thing to the Lord, gave her first fruits. Why? Because we want to give our very best. We don't want to give second rate. I'm not going to say, you know, God, you've, you've given us an increase and so, you know, we're going to hoard that for it. No, that's God giving us an increase. So now we're going to bless the Lord with it. And then God will keep increasing. Amen. Amen. And that's just the way God works. And that's the principles of God. And so, uh, you know, don't give, don't, don't get out of ritual, you know, um, habits and saying, well, it's just what we do. And so that's what we know. You know, give with a sincere, heartfelt Worship, saying, God, I'm worshiping you with this. Whatever it is, my talent, my wisdom, my, my experience, my knowledge, whatever it is that we worship God with and we sacrifice to God. Amen. Let's all stand this morning. Amen. God is good. Thank you for joining us in.
joining in with us on uh, Facebook Live this morning. We appreciate it. We pray that God blesses you. Uh, don't give God your leftovers. God doesn't want your leftover turkey. God doesn't want your leftover gravy, your leftover potatoes. He wants the very best. Amen. Give God your very best, and God will take care of the rest. Actually, in, in Matthew chapter 6, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be taken care of. And so seek first the kingdom of God. Give your very best to God and watch him do the rest. Amen. God, God bless you. We love you. Amen. God, we honor you this morning.